Um, good morning. Um, thanks, thanks to the organizers for allowing me to speak about this project. Oh, let me go over here. Um, so I'm a postdoc in Matthew Meyerson's lab, and I'm going to talk about a project um, that I'm co-leading with Alice Berger and Xiaoyun Wu, um, also in collaboration with uh, Jesse Boehm's lab. So recent cancer sequencing projects um, have has done a really great job of identifying many novel cancer genes. Um, however, we're still underpowered to detect um, all of the functionally relevant genes, um, as described um, in a paper by Mike, uh, Mike Lawrence and Gaddy Getz. Um, and uh, what, what, whoops, what's shown here um, at each, uh, each of these dots show um, the mutation frequency of each of these tumor types and how many um, samples have been sequenced. Um, and so for many of these uh, cancer types, we're very underpowered to detect the uh, relevantly, uh, the functional mutations in these genes, particularly those that occur at a very low rate. It's even more of a problem when we're um, trying to identify the specific variant in a gene um, that is functionally relevant. And so this is an example of EGFR, which is a, a very well characterized cancer gene, um, has many hotspot mutations, um, many clinically relevant mutations. Um, but what's shown here are all the mutations that's been observed across many uh, tumor types that have been sequenced. And there are many uh, uh, mutations that occur in only one patient. So the question is, um, are these also functionally relevant? Um, are they also doing a similar function as, the, as the, uh, these hotspot or very well characterized mutations? And so um, with Jesse Bowen, we've been thinking about um, how do we experimentally in a high throughput way functionally test the function of these, uh, many of these mutations. Um, and so given all these somatic variants we're identifying from these uh, cancer genome studies, um, we can create specific reagents to test their function and then uh, put these reagents through a host of assays, some of them being very pathway specific, um, but also we're interested in um, gene agnostic assays. So if you have no idea what the function of this gene is or what, what pathway it's involved in, um, we would like these types of assays to give us a more uh, broader picture of, of um, the function of these mutations. And so um, to, to, uh, to test this approach, um, we decided to look at mutations in lung adenocarcinoma. Um, not only is it um, one of the leading causes of cancer death worldwide, but it also has a very high mutation rate. And so identifying those mutations in lung adenocarcinoma that are, uh, that are functionally relevant above the background mutation rate, um, just purely computationally, is a, is a challenge. So our approach was to take um, mutations observed in lung adenocarcinoma from uh, two papers, um, including one from the TCGA project, and create an ORF library of both the wild type versions of uh, 47 genes, as well as uh, uh, missense and indel variants that were observed in these uh, genomes. And from this ORF library, we infected um, A549 lung cancer cells um, and in multiple replicates. And then after 96 hours assay gene expression using um, this approach called L1000, which is a reduced representation of the transcriptome, it only profiles 1,000 transcripts, um, but the benefit is that it's a very low cost, and so since we're assaying many, many variants in high replicate, um, that helps with, with the cost. So how are we um, predicting the functional impact of these mutations? We are taking uh, each replicate um, introduction, um, uh, and here I'm showing a heat map showing uh, the, the correlation or how similar the gene expression changes are between multiple replicates of, the, of a wild type ORF of um, this gene ARAF. And so you can see in the heat map, um, mostly red, meaning that the gene expression changes are very similar. Uh, when expressing this mutant version, um, V145L, also very consistent uh, gene expression changes. And then when comparing the mutant and wild type uh, replicates together, also very similar gene expression changes. So we would predict that maybe the mutation isn't doing um, anything to the function of the gene since the gene expression changes are similar. In contrast, another mutation in ARAF, um, this S214F, um, the, mut the mutant ORF version also gives a very strong consistent gene expression uh, signature. 
However, um, when comparing the mutant and wild type gene expression changes, they're very different. And so in, in this case, um, we would predict that uh, this mutation has a functional impact. So for each mutation, um, what we, what we uh, saw is that th these um, three sort of uh, heat maps could be represented as distributions. Um, and so using uh, a Kruskal-Wallis test, we could then ask, um, is there, does there appear to be a, a change in the distributions? And um, using um, this test and then doing an FDR correction, we then, for all of our variants, can predict which ones are likely to be functionally impactful versus not. So there's one other feature we saw um, from, these, from comparing these gene expression signatures, um, and that was a direct comparison between the wild type and mutant um, signatures. So um, the top two rows I'm showing, the ARAF case, um, here is a case for STK11, where when introducing the wild type uh, ORF, very strong consistent signatures, but um, introducing this mutant um, does not give as uh, consistent of signatures, and so we think that it's a uh, losing um, function. And then conversely, with this beta-catenin mutation, the wild type does give um, some consistent signature, but the mutation actually increases um, the consistency of the gene expression signature. So we represent these two features on this plot, which we're calling a sparkler plot. Um, so the x-axis shows the, um, the corrected p-value of that test to determine if there's a functional impact. And so anything that falls below our FDR cutoff um, would be predicted to be uh, inert. Um, and then the, for um, the comparison between wild type and mutant, um, things that look um, like a gain in function um, in, the, in the mutation are shown with a positive score, and those that are predicted to be loss of function uh, gets a negative score. So then when we look at the, this uh, visualization gene by gene, uh, we see these interesting patterns with known oncogenes, known tumor suppressors, and then we can look at other genes of unknown function. So um, many gain of function mutations or change of function in these known tumor suppressors, and I'm calling out the specific mutations. Um, for uh, these known tumor suppressor genes, again, m uh, many, many loss of function predictions with our approach. Um, and then finally, with genes with unknown function, um, some maybe have no um, mutations that are uh, predicted to be impactful, and then some that um, may have, have a functional impact. So how do we know these um, predictions are correct? Um, we have a set of benchmarks that, um, of known, uh, benchmarks of mutations with known function, um, and so we um, were very accurate with those. Um, the, we also did an approach to um, assess our fa false positive rate. So we had a very high replicate experiment where we did 21 replicates of um, a subsample of these ORFs. Um, and then if we simulate um, a, a smaller study where we just take eight reps uh, from the same ORF and predict how many times, um, or, or determine how many times we falsely determine something has an impact when we're actually sampling the same ORF, um, so from the simulation, we were able to see that our uh, false positive rate from the simulation uh, was very accurate to our um, expected uh, false discovery rate. Also, we're looking at correspondence with genetic um, hotspot mutations. Um, so this is one example in FBXW7, which is a known tumor suppressor. Um, these uh, two mutations here were predicted to not have an impact, whereas this one um, uh, was predicted to be loss of function. And um, when you look at the, uh, these mutations and the frequency of them in, here in Cosmic, um, the, the one mutation that has a predicted functional impact is right near a hotspot, and so you would um, potentially predict that that would be more functional than these other mutations. Um, another way we're assessing um, if a, a signature is, um, or, or how correct these predictions are, um, are to look at what the actual identity of the signatures are and, com and compare um, signatures between different alleles. And um, how we're doing that is um, one approach is through clustering. So if we take all of our ORFs and just cluster them together to look at transcriptional classes, um, we do see some um, known, core, uh, known connections, such as with KEEP1 and NERF2. Um, and then we see this um, large, uh, larger cl cluster here, um, and if we zoom in on that, uh, many of these uh, 
these ORFs in this cluster are um, known driver mutations um, in the EGFR RAS pathway. And so any mutation that we predict to be um, functional and is present in this pathway um, gives us stronger support um, that they are indeed functional. And so in that, within this cluster, we see uh, rare variants um, that, that were, again, these variants were observed in very low frequency across the cancer, uh, across all the lung adenocarcinomas that were identified. Um, and these were all predicted to have a functional impact and also cluster um, with known uh, activating mutations in this pathway. And so we can predict that, um, that these may also have a similar functional impact. So it wasn't that all rare mutations um, in these genes uh, clustered in this pathway. Um, so for example, for EGFR, there was one mutation, um, this H1129Y, uh, um, that also was predicted to have a functional impact, but was not clustering with the rest of the, the mutations. And so, um, we're currently investigating what this unique signature is. And so what I don't have time to talk about um, is um, other orthogonal assays that we're doing. I have one example on a poster today. Um, but we're also taking this ORF collection and um, putting it through a host of other assays um, that are more pathway specific, but also uh, potentially uh, general assays. And so uh, doing this type of um, impact phenotyping is really important to really understand what the function of all these specific variants are. And also um, at a broader level, if we don't know what the gene function is, it's important to um, try to map these mutations into, um, into functional pathways. Um, what's, uh, what, what's powerful about this gene expression approach is that it's agnostic. We, we don't need to know the actual function of the gene, but we're just comparing mutant wild types. So do we see a difference um, between uh, the, the expression changes that are induced um, upon uh, or with the mutated version? Um, and we think that this approach can be used for any gene. Again, um, uh, we're interested in expanding this to other variants, not necessarily cancer somatic variants, but um, and then also um, an interest of mine is splicing, and so I'm interested in expanding this to um, look at splice variants. Um, so with that, this was a, it's a huge effort by uh, many people at the Broad, um, and I'd first like to thank Alice Berger and Xiaoyi Nu, who are um, co-leading this project. Um, Jesse Bowen and Matt Meyerson um, and Todd Golub's lab has also helped a lot um, with this project. And um, as a shameless plug, I'm starting my own lab at UC Santa Cruz, so um, there are many positions open. Um, and I guess I'm a little early, but I can take your questions. So there'll be more time, I guess, for questions. Wow, nice work. Um, a question I have is uh, this. Uh, when you do this uh, gene expression profiling, obviously you get the uh, signature that is uh, associated to the mutation that the score positive in your assay. Uh, can you go back to the tumors, uh, to the primary tumors that harbor those mutations and see whether you see uh, an enrichment of that particular signature in those tumors? We haven't done that analysis yet, but that is exactly what we, we'd hope to do. I, I did a very um, superficial analysis of that, and we didn't see the same um, type of signature, but I'm trying out uh, other approaches to, to and see And another question. Case. Obviously, here you look for expression changes. I mean, there is a likelihood, in your opinion, that the driver mutation may not necessarily influence gene expression, or do you anticipate that any driver mutation, directly or indirectly, at one point will affect the gene expression? Um, so, short answer is I, I think that um, all mutations won't affect gene expression. We may see um, changes at the methylation level. We were only assaying gene ex expression. Um, we, we tested actually a splicing factor mutation and didn't see 
big changes, so we think that's because it's effective splicing and we weren't able to assay that. Um, so we're hoping um, th that this concept and actually of the wild type mutant comparison, but maybe with other assays, so if it's affecting methylation, maybe you can use those same concepts, but for different assays. And the, the one that we are um, uh, testing out now is cell profiling, so um, imaging um, different features of, um, of cells after introdu uh, introduction of these ORFs and then seeing if um, we can use the same approaches. Yeah. So on a related note, I can imagine there could be some very uh, either cell type specific mutations or very time dependent changes in gene expression. So I was wondering, um, I mean, I'm sure I have lymphomas uh, mutations that won't score an epithelial cell line. Um, so, so how did you uh, look at that? Or in another way of saying it is, did you, you had great results, but were there any hot spots or anything you were pretty darn sure was a, gonna be a, a functional thing from some other point of view and didn't score? Actually, so for everything that we knew about, we did see um, a functional effect. Um, however, we, um, what we've now started to do is um, take these into different cell lines. So what, we, what I was showing was data from an uh, A549, which is a lung cancer cell line. It has um, background mutations in some of the genes that we assayed. Um, and so putting in different contexts, so we have uh, primary lung cell lines, a different lung cancer cell line, and we actually do see some differences. So one example um, is in KEEP1. So A549 has KEEP1 mutations. Um, so yeah, the cell line itself has KEEP1 mutations, and so um, we still think we're reading off um, a loss of function mutation because um, the, the, the mutant version can, can no longer rescue the, the wild type um, function, but then when we put it in um, a different cell context with KEEP1 wild type uh, mutations, we actually may see potentially dominant negative effects, but we are still seeing a functional effect, but maybe the sort of direction of the effect um, changes. So what about the, how are you gonna deal with real lineage specific effects or, or things that require the presence of other um, oncogenes that are mutated that are not present in your test? Yeah, I mean, we, we really understand that there's a lot of context uh, effects, and so when we assay them, we'll just have to take those into consideration. Our next speaker is uh, Sin Tao Wu, uh, he's from Brown University and is going to tell us about Comet, a statistical approach to identify combinations of mu mutually exclusive alterations in cancer.